One of my favorite things as a legally blind person is technology, and that's because it can break down barriers and provide access to parts of the world or see the world in a way that I couldn't before. But at the same time, as a blind person, I'm very reliant on people, developers, to make their apps accessible and actually remember me in the design process, remember people like me. This past Monday, Apple kicked off WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference. This is an annual expo or conference that Apple does every year. And typically it's only limited to Apple developers. It's for tons of people try to attend, only a select number are able to usually attend in this space that they're able to occupy in Northern California. Sometimes it's San Jose, sometimes it's like Cupertino. It's a great experience, it's hands-on, but it's also a little bit exclusive. I usually get to attend, I've gotten to attend the last three years so I could attend accessibility related sessions and partake and, and report on those new accessibility offerings from both Apple and developers that are taking place there. Due to the current state of the world, events like this in 2020 are looking different. They are taking place virtually oftentimes, and that's very much what Apple did. Their big keynote event took place in a more pre-recorded, scripted format that allowed for a faster pace for them to show off their beautiful space, of course, at Apple Park. And during that event, they covered the future of their platforms, software specifically. So they talked about iOS 14, they talked about iPadOS 14, macOS 11, or Big, Big sir. sir. Though obviously Apple is there to show off their new firmware offerings, there's also a big emphasis on developers and their new products and developers networking and, and, and looking at ways to improve their apps. And luckily one of these areas that gets a lot of focus, especially a push from Apple, is accessibility. Accessibility can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people, but specifically for people with disabilities, accessibility means usually having access to products and services and spaces that normally present barriers in the way that our society designs or constructs or architects these types of spaces. Accessibility is really cool. In general, it leads to innovation when you design with accessibility in mind. I do wanna talk real fast about some of the features that Apple introduced this year for accessibility specifically. Though some accessibility features can be specific and really niche for certain people's needs, there's also broad usability for many of them. One of these is Backtap. Backtap allows you to do a double tap on the back of your iPhone or even a triple tap and you can program that to one of many things such as bringing up Siri, going home, opening control center, even doing a shake. Double tapping will substitute the idea of doing a shake to undo your typing. Uh, you can program it how best fits you. For me, it's great because you can even program that action to be an accessibility shortcut to enable things such as the magnifier or zoom or voiceover. This feature only works with iPhone models that feature an edge to edge display. So iPhone 10, 10S, 10R, 10S Max, 11, 11 Pro, 11 Pro Max those ones. That may change come release of iOS 14 in the fall, but that's all I know that works so far. Another tip that I just want to mention is iPhone has widgets on the home screen that are customizable. No longer are they just on the side with your notification center or the spotlight area. Instead, you can now actually customize different size widgets that really fit within the rest of your icons and really customize this area. I would suggest that you have widgets that are big and usually aren't meant to be interacted with, but only to really gather quick information from at the top of your screen and use your most used icons at the bottom. So things such as maybe your text messaging, mail, whatever it might be, have those towards the bottom of your home screen. That way they're just easier to reach, especially as these phones get bigger and our thumbs are only so far in length. Though this next feature doesn't necessarily impact me, I think it's really cool for my friends who are deaf or hard of hearing, especially those who use sign language. FaceTime is already known as a great way to connect with friends, family, and maybe even conference with people in a group setting with up to 32 people. But maybe someone is deaf or hard of hearing on that call. Instead of typing things, you might have a sign language interpreter. Using AI, iOS will be able to detect where sign language is being used and who, and make them more prominent and larger in size within that group of people who are FaceTiming. Really great so that that way, even people who are speaking won't be speaking over the people who are signing. On the topic of those who are deaf and hard of hearing, another great feature is sound recognition. Within the accessibility settings under hearing, you'll be able to enable sound recognition. And this way you can enable specific sounds that your iPhone can try to listen out for. So that way if you hear a dog barking, a fire alarm going off, a smoke detector, things that you might wanna be notified or alerted when these sounds are going off in the room. Another great feature for those who are hard of hearing and maybe use AirPods, well, now you can actually adjust the AirPods and customize them to your hearing, where maybe specific sounds that you'll listen to are going to be 
more accommodated to you. I'm likely not the best to describe this feature. I'm a video guy, not an audio guy. With the next major release, AirPod Pros are going to be able to actually emulate spatial audio or surround sound in this case, like Dolby Atmos. I love my AirPods and I love watching content with noise canceling turned on. So this is gonna be great when I'm watching something like on Apple TV Plus where as a blind viewer, I use audio descriptions. Audio descriptions are an extra track of audio that narrate the visual elements of a film. And Apple is one of the very few services that actually offers audio descriptions in a more immersive format, such as Adobe Atmos. And I'll be able to actually experience this without a huge theater setup within my living room. Now, one of the biggest innovations to come of this new update is voiceover recognition. For those who are not informed, voiceover is a way for me as a blind person to experience my phone, experience technology. It's a screen reader. There are many screen readers out there, but this is the native one that Apple has built into their Mac, built into the iPhone, iPad, watch, Apple TV. If they have a device that uses audio, it can probably become a screen reader. A screen reader such as voiceover is a different different way to actually interact with your phone. It actually uses a cursor, like a block cursor, that you use different gestures to move that cursor around. And as you are moving that around, it's actually narrating what's on screen. So Apple has offered VoiceOver, the screen reader, on the iPhone for over a decade now. But they keep adding new innovations to it every year. And this year is probably one of the biggest leaps yet in terms of innovation. VoiceOver recognition is a brand new feature set that allows VoiceOver to try and fill in the gaps for apps that are inaccessible or weren't labeled properly. When you are browsing inaccessible web pages or applications with VoiceOver, it will try to do its best using machine learning technology to detect things such as imagery and describe those images or buttons and try to describe what these buttons will do if you do click on them. Now, as excited as I am for this feature, not only as a blind user, but as someone who just loves technology and innovation, keep in mind, this is no excuse to make your apps inaccessible. This is no excuse to not design your apps with accessibility in mind. As a developer or a web designer, there are best practices and work under the hood that you have to do in order to make your apps compatible with our screen readers. Typically, if you are a developer with Apple or other platforms, there's resources for you that are provided by the platforms to actually make your apps accessible, whether it be checklists or guides on how to go about it best practice wise. And if you would like to go further and create a more innovative and accessible application or product, well, you can always hire consultants who specialize in accessibility auditing. I most recently worked on the critically acclaimed PlayStation 4 title, The Last of Us Part Two. I worked with Sony and Naughty Dog in order to help make that game the most accessible AAA title to date. And despite that game being a beautiful, fully 3D world with action and, and sequences and a whole movie playing out, it is accessible and it can be played by people who are totally blind. But it is one thing to just hear from me, a blind person who wants your app to be accessible because I love to be able to try and use it. Why not hear from a developer? I spoke to Robin Knatzer. She's a software engineer in France working at a startup called Panda Guide. Their mission is to create apps that are accessible for the blind and low vision within France. I spoke to Robin on the Blind Abroad podcast, my podcast where I highlight things such as accessibility, disability related stories, and travel. When it comes down to it, it doesn't add that much time to your development process, um, which is always what managers are trying to cut down on. <laughs> but in theory, it's more, um, Apple does a lot by default. So even if you don't try to make your app for a blind person, a blind person may still try and use your app and mm -hmm. uh, read whatever the default settings are, which can be kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> because, so yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah, yeah. tell me about what, what could happen if a blind person uses an quote unquote inaccessible app, but um, voiceover tries to make it accessible for, for them. Well, it could be something funny all the way to something uh, terrible. <laughs> um, so in your in your code, as a developer, you, you name all of the things. I will name a button a certain name, like a back button or a save button, uh, something natural. But when you're just starting out as a developer, sometimes you aren't as, uh, as neat and tidy as maybe some experienced developers who have already made mistakes. So uh, like me, maybe you were frustrated one day and your boss says, I want a button right there on this screen. And so you name that button, this stupid button that my boss wants on this screen, thinking that no one is going to see it but you because it's hidden in the code. But actually, uh, that could be read by, by voiceover um, when it comes down to it. So you, James, flipping through the <laughs> app that I wrote when I was frustrated at work, uh, it could say something like, this stupid button. And you could say that what just happened there, what am I looking at on this app? <laughs>
so the, you know next thing you know you have a person emailing you um because if anything I, I know blind people like to send feedback for apps um yes. yeah, those who are <laughs> especially those who are enthusiastically ready to use the app and next thing you know it's not working the way it should robin had so much more insight about what it's like developing accessible apps as a sighted person if you are a developer designer or interested in technology accessibility or maybe that conversation intrigues you we go further in depth with her journey and what it's like developing apps for the blind. You can listen to the full podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or just go to blindabroad forward slash podcast to find it. Experiencing something with voiceover recognition will not be the same experience as properly experiencing it with voiceover when it's been crafted in a way that you probably intended as a developer. A comparison that I'd like to make to this is, as a creator here on YouTube, I feel it's my responsibility to make my videos accessible with what YouTube offers me. So closed captioning so that my videos can reach people who are deafblind or deaf and hard of hearing or people who maybe speak different languages. It's a great thing to offer closed captions that are properly executed. Now, yes, YouTube does offer auto captions and they have gotten better thanks to machine learning over time, but they've been around for several years and they are still by no means great when it comes to punctuation, grammar, and sometimes they just get it flat wrong. Too many times I've seen the auto captions make people on a family-friendly video or brand-friendly video say some sort of slur or inappropriate thing. So I cannot recommend that you use auto captions if you are a YouTube content creator because it just, it won't get it right. In conclusion, it's important that you reach as many people as possible, no matter what the content is that you make, whether it's a video, a game, a web page, an application, whatever it might be, make it accessible. Honestly, I'd like to play your games. I'd like to check out your webpage. Accessibility, you'll never get it right, right away, especially, and it's a continuous practice, but by just indulging yourself with the community, with the resources that are available for whatever medium that you're using, it's important because someday, I'm sure, if you don't have all the same senses or they're not as strong as they once were, you would probably would like to experience your content, the stuff that you produced, the same way as everyone else. Let me know in the comments, have you ever faced a barrier that prevented you from being able to use a service or, or a product that you like? Could have been transportation, could have been an application, whatever it might be. I'm curious what that experience was like for you. And I hope that maybe by sharing that we can all do better. I hope that you could see different today and I will hear you next time.